I witnessed the Soviet collapse and then later on I couldn't help noticing that something very similar is happening to the United States. So as a matter of public service, I've tried to warn people what to expect. But I would just like to point out that I'm not any sort of, uh, you know, uh, a policy wonk or, or a wannabe politician or um, um, an activist. All of those things are sort of very tangential to what I'm interested in, which is basically to warn people and equipment, equip them for, for what's coming up. The way collapse unfolds is actually very interesting because a lot of it has to do with people's faith in the status quo. As long as people think that there is something in it for them, they will cooperate. As soon as they decide that there is nothing in it for them, then they will cease to cooperate and the system starts to crumble, cave in on itself. So what we saw in the Soviet Union was uh, political dysfunction where uh, basically the, the, the communist regime was so endemically corrupt and, and so out to, to, uh, to steal as much as they could at the very end that they really didn't, didn't bother even paying attention to whether the, they, they kept the system going. The system was basically on autopilot till it crashed. And, and some, something similar is happening here where we have people in all branches of government, both political parties, really trying to prop up the, the financial industry, which has become completely irrelevant to most people in the United States who don't have savings and are not credit worthy. And, and they're basically trying to use up people's savings and use up people's retirement to, to prop up this uh, set of institutions that only help the, the very rich people and these very rich people are only rich on paper. They're long paper, all of them. They, what, what they own is pieces of paper with letters and numbers on them, which will turn out to be worthless. So this is all just uh, basically musical chairs, and something very similar was happening in the Soviet Union, and something like that is happening here. The reason I, I started talking about this is because uh, I was, frankly, very worried about the United States, because I saw the United States as not nearly as well prepared for collapse as, as the Soviet Union. Uh, you see, the Russian people never had a, a great deal of faith in their government or in the system. So they, they grew and gathered a lot of their own food. They relied on private personal connections. Uh, there was a very large uh, gray or black economy that provided what, most of what people needed. So when the system went away, people had something to hold on to. They had their personal relationships. And also, the, the, the country was set up in a way that was much more stable with public transportation, with public housing. People were not stranded and people were not dispossessed and put out on the street and evicted. Um, so all of those things allowed the Russians to survive collapse and all of those things are pretty much missing in this country. Most people in this country would pretty much just, just be out on the streets starving unless they have an income, unless they have credit cards or a bank account. They're just woefully unprepared. There, there's, there's an element to, to market economics that is very hard-edged, and when it fails, it, it hurts people, uh, whether they can um, afford to pay their way out of it or not. If they can afford to pay their out of it, 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 it basically hurts their soul uh, because you know they're just leaving everybody else behind. Um, and there's a lot of fear with it because you're, you're really, your umbilical is, is connected to your bank account. Once that goes away, then you're just completely lost. Now, a lot of the dislocation that went on in the Soviet Union really had to do with, with people, um, you know, being, being sort of set adrift in, 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 the, in the official economy, and all they, kept, all they could fall back on is um, people they knew, people they could trust who would help them. And um, the whole mindset of uh, what's mine is mine and I get it by paying for it is, is really not very survival oriented. Um, one, of, one of the shocking things about Americans is that they have this innate faith that the rich people will abide. There will always be rich people. And the rich people have bought into this, this, uh, you know, this dream, this, this, uh, this idea that uh, the various symbols that they have that, that tell them they're rich you know, pieces of paper and things uh, will actually be meaningful moving forward. But it seems like the the, high, the the further you have to fall, the harder you will fall. So I think, you know, the, the wealthy people in the United States are in for a much ruder awakening than the people who are poor already. But 
really the, the most important thing to consider is who do you know and how will they help you even if you don't give them any money for it. It's as basic as that. In case of the Russians, it turned out that money was borderline irrelevant for a lot of things that people needed to survive. That's what allowed them to survive. That's not the case here. And it's time to get very worried about that. The Five Stages of Collapse is uh, an essay that I published uh, two and a half years ago uh, when nobody was really talking about a financial collapse. People were talking about a financial crisis. And I decided to uh, try to think of uh, how this proceeds in identifiable stages. And I thought that basically it's, it's sort of like the, the, the Kubler-Ross hierarchy uh, relating to grief. And here it has to do with something similar, which is psychological thresholds that are breached. Um, various um, bits of faith that we have in the status quo and in, in society and the people around us. Uh, when they're invalidated, the change can be rather sudden, whereas changes in the physical world take time to work out. So the stages were financial collapse, where our um, assumptions about risk in the future are invalidated, then political collapse, which is basically our assumptions that uh, there is a political system that, that functions and can serve the interest of the people at some level, that is invalidated. Then there's commercial collapse, which is the idea that you can get whatever you need by paying for it, is invalidated because your money is worthless or you don't have any anymore. Um, and then uh, there is social and cultural collapse, which um, I, I got by reading some, some cultural anthropology. But basically, social collapse is when the social infrastructure that people have, be it charities or social organizations or community-based groups, uh, cease to function because they're overwhelmed, they run out of resources, and people can no longer rely on them. And then cultural collapse, I, I got the idea from uh, reading Colin Turnbull, who described a, a completely failed uh, African society um, of uh, dispossessed hunter-gatherers, where basically family structure fell apart. Parents no longer brought up their children, they didn't uh, take care of the old people, families didn't even share food. Um, they, they basically got food and ate it by themselves and hid it from each other. And that was the level at which uh, humans stop re resembling humans and people no longer recognize each other. And, and you're really, at that point, you're, you're almost talking about a different animal, uh, not what we have evolved as, but something that we might evolve into, devolve into. I'm always asked this question, where are we in, in the collapse scenario? And, and uh, the question is, who are we? Um, I know a lot of people who are pretty far along in the collapse scenario. I like to tell people that social and cultural collapse has, in some places in this country, already run its course. Um, financial collapse, well, it depends on whether you've been bankrupted or foreclosed yet. It's, it's a bit of a, um, you know, it, it, you, you could say that for a lot of people, collapse has already arrived. It just hasn't been widely distributed, and um, people don't actually share stories about it. Um, unless they actually know each other personally. So um, I would say that this is something that is, that, that is proceeding apace. Uh, you, could, you could say, for instance, that um, um, the United States is already ba bankrupt as a country. Uh, I don't think that you could actually get a, a, a cogent argument against that from anyone who, who knows what they're talking about. It's just that the, the aftermath of that hasn't really completely arrived. We're not yet completely immersed in the, in, the, in the consequences of that. Now, in terms of what could be done to salvage the situation, well, uh, a lot of things would have to uh, change rather dramatically. Uh, right now, there's uh, basically uh, uh, a stranglehold on political power in this country by uh, an elite that divides itself into, into two camps, Republicans and Democrats and what have, to, may, what have you, maybe even more. But it's really the same bunch of people. And this same bunch of people is almost militant in refusing to look at reality. And um, it's almost a question of them at some point being wheeled out of their offices along with the, with the office furniture. It's not like they can be really spoken to without it being one's complete waste of time. So I see that quite similar to what the old communists went through. Basically, they, they went from being in charge to being crazy, to being insane and being disregarded. I see something very similar happening here. 
The question for why there's so much denial is, is really interesting one. Denial is a large question in itself. There are certainly a, f a few aspects to it that, that are interesting. One is that it makes possible for people to, to lead uh, what amounts to a meaningless dead-end existence because the moment they realize that it's meaningless and it's dead end, then they, they're forced to do something about it, and if they can't think of anything useful to do about it, then they're stuck. They're stuck with a mental difficulty. So denial is a way of avoiding mental difficulties. Another part of it is that if, if you actually have a long-term perspective on the future, that makes you very unpopular in any given group of people because the future as it stands in a market economy is a faulty product. It cannot be sold for any price. No sane person would pay for it. And so if we live in an environment where we sell ourselves by putting things on our resumes and promoting ourselves in various ways and thinking of what we're worth within a market economy, actually being honest about what we're looking forward to, all of us, makes us less successful as individuals. And so this is something that we avoid doing. I think what's going to happen is uh, the dissolution of, of the United States as a political and economic entity. It, it will more or less fade from the world scene in the same way that the Soviet Union faded from, from the world scene. Um, parts of it will later be reborn um, as something that we might have a lot more trouble imagining because there isn't something called Russia that was part of the Soviet Union. There isn't something similar to that in the United States. It's really a bunch of territories, very, very disjoint territories held together by, by Washington. So if Washington fails, then it's not clear what's going to hold these territories together. The reason Washington is likely to fail is really the same reason that Moscow failed, uh, which is runaway debt and national bankruptcy. Uh, it was not even the level of debt, it was the fact that the debt could not be expanded or taken on at an ever-increasing rate with never any reason for anyone to expect that the gap can ever be closed. So what happened in Moscow is that uh, Moscow could no longer finance the periphery and the periphery decided to go its own way. We're seeing something similar in this country where California could do quite well if they stopped paying the federal tax. So if they left the Union, their finances would be much better. And this is what happened in the Soviet Union. This is, what, this is what we're witnessing right now in the United States. There are other similarities as well. One of the largest ones is um, in the Soviet Union, the armed forces more or less took on a life of their own. They ate the national budget, about a quarter of it, uh, and also they couldn't deliver any results. And so. Uh, it's a striking similarity that uh, the, Soviet, the mighty Soviet army lost in Afghanistan and now the mighty American army is doing exactly the same thing. It's really, am it amazes me that dying empires shoot straight for Afghanistan to, to have the Afghanis uh, deliver the coup de grace. And, and this is what's happening to the United States as well. Well, the, the, the power vacuum that was left when, um, when, when the Soviet empire collapsed um, was, it was not a complete vacuum. There was, there was a lot of, of uh, black market economics uh, active within the Soviet Union. There was a lot of what would be called corruption, but really there were workable ways of circumventing an unworkable system. There is some of that in this country as well. Um, strangely enough, the people who are the best positioned to start a full-blown black market economy in the United States are the narco cartels. So they're the next aristocracy as far as the Americans are concerned. They will be the ones moving in and replacing the power vacuum. You already see it happening in certain parts of the country close to the Mexican border. And you can see that the local police are in, you know, and law enforcement are in no position to oppose them. They're much better organized and armed. So this is what we, we can look forward to. A lot of that happened in Russia as well. There, was, there were a lot of ethnic mafias that moved in. Uh, the Chechens uh, controlled a lot of the trade for quite a while, and even in, in produce and things like that. So we can look forward to quite a bit of that here as well. There was a lot of what you could call corporatocracy in the Soviet Union as well. There were a lot of very large state-owned enterprises that uh, went on existing because they, they were they didn't really have a supply chain. They, they were empires onto themselves. Uh, 
a place like Norilsk Nickel, for, for instance, that makes a lot of the nickel in the world, uh, was pretty much a company town. There were, that, that was a standard thing in Russia. Uh, it, it's not just a factory, but also cafeterias and kindergartens and hospitals and retirement homes and just about everything else. So these were uh, economic empires onto themselves that continued to function. A lot of them, once there was no workable currency, they resorted to barter trade. And, and uh, they, they would trade food for uh, something that they made or stock that they had accumulated over the years. Uh, the, the American corporatocracy is very much into just-in-time delivery and um, everything is network-based and, and that makes it extremely fragile. And, and I don't see that pattern holding. A while ago I thought that uh, some large companies like Google, for instance, could uh, take a lot of things in-house. And Google has been making forays into energy and, and private currencies and all sorts of things. They, they have money to throw at experiments like that. But they're not about to achieve any sort of sustainability. So when the surrounding economy crumbles, uh, they will probably cease to function as well. People look at the short term, um, energy availability in the short term. Basically, the, the fact that uh, energy demand shrank because of the recession slash depression, that bought us a little bit of time. Um, but it it, it's more or less um, it's more or less inevitable that um, some kind of economic growth somewhere will resume at some point, and then whatever part of the economy that tries to grow is going to hit a brick wall again. And and the harder economies try to grow from from this point on, the the worse they will fail. Uh, the more the more growth dependent and growth addicted they are, um, the worse they will fail. Uh, and countries vary uh, in, you know, along a set of parameters between how well they can absorb uh, lack of economic growth. Some can do it pretty well, some not at all. So th this is really what, what we're looking at. Now, we could have a scenario where entire uh, parts of the globe suddenly go dark. Um, and I think the United States is one of them because 60% of uh, all of the transportation fuels are imported. Uh, a lot of that is on credit. Um, a, a large chunk of, of, the, uh, of the trade deficit is actually transportation fuels. So when those stop arriving because of inability to borrow more and more money, then the economy is at a standstill and after a while the lights go on. Now what that, bu what that buys the rest of the world is about a third of all the energy consumed in the United States. The United States consumes about a third of the global energy supply. That suddenly becomes available to the rest of the world. So you could theoretically have other countries grow for another decade or more while uh, the United States goes dark and disappears, fades from the world scene, much as the Soviet Union did uh, after it collapsed. Well, the, the important thing to, to understand about collapse is it all it, it's brought on by uh, overreach and overstretch and, and people being zealots and trying too hard. It's not brought on by people being laid back and doing the absolute minimum. Um, the Amer Americans could very easily feed themselves and close themselves and have a place to live working maybe a hundred days a year. You know, it's a rich country in terms of resources. There's really no reason to, to work more than maybe a third of, of, of your time. And, and that's, that's sort of a standard pattern um, in the world. But if you want to build a huge empire and have endless economic growth and, and, and have uh, the largest number of billionaires on the planet, um, then, then you have to, to work uh, over 40 hours uh, a week all the time. And if you don't, then uh, you're in danger of going bankrupt. So that's the predicament that people have ended up in. Now, the cure, of course, is not to do the same thing even harder. So what people have to get used to these the idea is that most things aren't worth doing anyway and and things really slow down when the economy goes away uh, and uh, the idea is to do the absolute bare minimum that is essential uh, and and just find interesting ways to while away the time because not much is going to be happening so um, walking down the road um, is an all-day affair, whereas before it was a three-minute drive, but now you don't drive, you walk. So it's an all-day affair. 
And people just have to learn to, to slow way down and have a lot more pa patience and a lot, a lot more patience with each other. Um, and those that don't will probably end up killing each other in due course. Uh, that's probably a period of time that most people will want to sit out, wait till the dust settles. A lot of people just don't have the right character to deal with collapse. You know, they'll, they'll be running around trying to fix things, and that's the opposite of what they should be doing. Peak oil is, is uh, getting to be a really boring subject. Uh, most people don't realize that yet. But it's something that becomes obvious after the fact. It's something that shows up in aggregate production statistics, and those statistics tend to be uh, retroactively adjusted as better numbers come in. So now we're pretty sure that it was in 2005, 2006 for conventional oil, that is oil uh, that comes out in oil form out of the ground on dry land, uh, out of conventional oil wells. And then all liquids, uh, which includes tar sands and you know, coal to liquid conversion and corn-based ethanol and just any other muck that you could possibly get liquid fuels from, that peaked in 2008. So it's all behind us. So the thing that's worth discussing now is what post-peak production looks like. A lot of people look at these charts that have a very smooth decline curve um, that always looked a little strange to me. So I, I did a lot of research into trying to figure out what that meant. And it turned out that it's, it's just sheer nonsense. There's no reality behind it at all. And I've identified many, many factors that combine in various unpredictable ways. It's really too complicated to predict. But the chance of this very smooth decline, I would say, is zero. It's going to be a stepwise decline, and various parts of the planet will be cut off from transportation fuel permanently at various times. There will be disruptions, and then it will be a permanent cutoff from that point on. So what people should be planning on is not slightly more expensive gasoline or slightly less gasoline or heating oil or diesel fuel, but um, fuel that you might have for special occasions. So for ambulances, you, you might have, have it for longer than for taxis, things like that. But you, you, what people should really be planning for is life without fossil fuels at all. And that is actually a tall order. That is actually, it takes a lot of thinking to, to prepare for that right now. The, the whole question of die-off produces very strong emotions in people, but just to, to kind of to lay it out in a, in a non-emotional way, we had this thing called the Green Revolution, which is probably the worst misnomer we have, because it basically it was uh, the fossil fuel f food revolution. It's growing, growing food with fossil fuels that allowed um, the, the Earth's population to go to six and a half billion. And there's no reason to think that it can be sustained through means other than uh, fossil fuel inputs into, into industrial agriculture. So the question is what happens to all these people when they can no longer be fed? Now, people think that this is in the future, but it's not. Uh, Russia is back to importing grain after the, the disastrous harvest of this year. And that's a bad sign right there. Russia used to be a, 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 a grain exporter until this year. And, and so that is happening in more and more parts of the world. Now, die-offs, uh, people have trouble imagining them. There was a bit of a die-off in the Soviet Union after the Soviet Union collapsed. Life expectancy plummeted. And the odd thing about it is I was there during that time, and it's not really noticeable unless you happen to be dropping by the hospitals and the morgues all the time and going to a lot of funerals. You just don't know that people are going away. It's, it's more that people look at their their school photos and realize that half the class is dead. Um, and that's a bit of a shock. But it's more of a shock when you realize it than when it's happening, because you don't really realize that it's happening. And in fact, human populations can shrink quite dramatically without anyone, even within those populations, really noticing. People, people just accept whatever is happening and, and tune it out, stop paying attention, or, or cope with it in some way. But that said, okay, we have six and a half billion people without fossil fuel inputs into agriculture. We might sustain uh, one billion, but that's without climate change. Now, the reason we have agriculture is because uh, we've had 10,000 years of 
stable climate which seems to have ended. So that is something to take into consideration as well. As hunter-gatherers, as opposed to farmers, we would not be one billion without fossil fuel inputs. would be a lot smaller population than that even. And, and so this is, this is one of those things that people try not to think about. And the question that comes to my mind is why should we even think about it? I mean, whatever happens, happens. We, we don't get to decide how many people get to survive. All we can do is uh, you know, try to survive. Um, and find ways to do it. Um, thinking about you know, mind-numbing billions of people that will no longer be around is not really a productive activity given that there's nothing we can do about it. So I, I try to, to limit discussion of that because I just don't see it going anywhere useful. Well, the whole climate change debate, you know, is, it, it almost makes me laugh because people say things uh, and the, the words, if you, if you look at it, what do they mean and they don't mean anything and the, the most important question is what do we do? Now I have a problem with defining we and I have a problem with defining do. Just on a semantic level I think that that particular question is completely meaningless. We includes melting tundra. We don't actually tell it what to do. It does whatever it wants to. And, and do involves people who are completely beyond our control politically, economically, otherwise. And it, so it doesn't really even matter what we decide. Uh, people have this inflated picture of what policy can achieve uh, that is not based on what policy has achieved in, in the past. Um, there is one example of a great policy achievement that Al Gore talks about, which is uh, uh, limitations on refrigerants that were destroying the ozone layer. Well. That was a bit of a success, but uh, it only involved a few chemical manufacturers around the planet. So those could be individually talked to, and replacements could be found. And, and what they've achieved is that the ozone hole is now not growing anymore, but it's not shrinking either. So it's not really uh, a complete success, and that's really the only success story they have. But in terms of global warming, it seems like we're in for a roller coaster ride. It's, it's not even that we can predict what's going to happen, but we can certainly predict that there will be a lot of upheaval. We don't need scientists to tell us that. I've been living in, in New England for decades now, and I'm used to the ocean being cold. So if in the middle of the summer I jump in the ocean and it's body temperature, you don't have to be a scientist to tell me that something is going very strangely here. You know, it's, it's really quite obvious. And people who are a little bit more in tune with the elements, um, People who spend a lot of time outdoors, you can talk to them. They, they will, very few of them will tell you that, oh, this is nothing out of the ordinary, this is the usual thing. Uh, so we're in for a great deal of climate upheaval. Um, I, I, I would predict that you know, when, when the industrial economies around the world start crashing, there will be a huge amount of reforestation that will happen. So then we might have a mini ice age because of that. And, and uh, then that might run its course and something else will happen. But, but the kind of Goldilocks climate that has allowed uh, human populations to, to swell to billions of, of individuals, that period of, of climatic his history seems to have ended already. We're, we're, in a different, we're in a different planet now. We're in a different world. Please come back and watch complete interviews with each of the experts. And you can join me, Tom Hartman, anytime on the web at TomHartman.com.